Today's discussion is, uh, is a central one within category theory, and we'll be going over yet another foundational concept um, that's going to build on the very basic understanding articulated in previous sessions. Um, well, previously, we had talked about uh, categories, um, and categories as uh, being these constructs, which uh, include uh, objects, but more importantly, for this subject, uh, morphisms, um, these arrows uh, between objects. And um, I had noted that the, the philosophy of category theory is such that, um, that the uh, relationships between things uh, are at the heart of, of, of interest. And uh, therefore, when it comes to categories, uh, a great deal of our attention lies in these, not just in the objects, but the morphisms that link them. Those interdependencies um, are, are quite central to the, um, to the practical application and uh, the philosophical perspective of, of category theory. And today's lecture um, is going to apply both the, the, the practical and the, that philosophical um, perspective uh, at a wider level. Um, we're going to be dealing not only with, with these uh, categories, um, which, which bundle together these, these objects and morphisms in ways that, um, uh, that carry some nice properties and obey certain laws, but we're going to be looking at relationship between categories, our relationships between categories as co captured by this construct called a functor. Um, and so rather the than the attention being uh, wholesaledly on, on a category, we're going to be uh, asking about the relationships between categories and using that to great effect. Um, there were some hints in this direction already that you had encountered, this notion of finding patterns, for example, uh, amongst the objects and the, uh, the morphisms, um, uh, really can only be well explicated in the context of these functors. And um, the, the very uh, concepts that we've been talking about, uh, about uh, categories being uh, consisting of, on the one hand, um, uh, these objects, and on the other, these, these morphisms, um, uh, are then going to be uh, extended another level to deal with uh, categories of, of categories, or a little bit, uh, to be safe, for categories of small categories. Of, of categories with finite sets of objects, um, where the morphisms between them will be functors, um, the subject of today's discussion. Um, so today's discussion um, is going to take that perspective of category theory and apply it um, to link up categories with functors. And as you'll see, uh, this is more than a sort of philosophical perspective or conceptual orientation. Uh, these constructs of uh, constructs of functors play a huge role in practical application of category theory. Um, uh, and uh, we saw in the videos uh, some applications of them in functional programming, uh, where we have um, type constructors or generics or or templates, depending, you know, pick your pick your language for the terminology, um, which uh, which essentially map uh, objects, which are types, uh, to other objects um, in a, what could be another category. Typically, is the same category of the uh, uh, of associated with the programming language. Let's say Hask the category, the pseudo category of, 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 of Haskell. And we map objects, types, to other types, to, to, to other objects. Uh, so for example, we might map a, an int to be a list of ints, or a maybe event, uh, or a tree events, um, and uh, reader events. And this mapping from types to types is um, 
making use of a, a functor. It's illustrating the, the use of a functor. But what's more interesting is, in this context, using that functor to operate on the morphisms. Because again, and again, and again, the attention is on those relationships rather than the categories themselves. And, and we'll see that within this context, the functor applied to a morphism lifts that morphism. Um, so a morphism that goes from, let's say, ints to doubles now can be lifted so it will map list of ints to list of doubles or maybes of ints to maybes of doubles or trees of ints to trees of doubles, and, and, and readers of ints to readers of doubles, and so on. Um, and so functors uh, are, are quite central to uh, the practice of functional programming. Um, they're also central to practical spheres of application of category theory within the domain of, of modeling. Um, and we'll be coming around to this uh, after our next lecture for a richer perspective, um, uh, taking a highland route uh, to the same destination to which we've canoed along the bottomlands. Um, so uh, here we're going to be uh, taking on the central uh, theoretic, conceptual, practical concept of, of functors. And at first blush, uh, one could be excused for thinking there's not much there. But I would argue that um, uh, it bears closer attention than that. There's actually a fair bit of subtlety. And um, um, if I'm skillful in the application of this next hour and, a, in, in, in three quarters, um, I'll be able to help um, point to and, and explicate some of these points of subtlety that often throw students off. They look at it at first glance and think they've mastered it, whereas really there's, there's some additional uh, details that merit consideration. Um, and some of the exercises I've provided uh, seek to, to offer uh, that sort of um, um, opportunity to explore it in a little bit more depth. So enough of the talking head. Um, we're going to uh, try to uh, share my screen and dive in to uh, some of the material and on occasion, the blackboard. So I'm gonna unpin myself um, and um, uh, I'm going to have to, okay, this is, a, uh, this is an interesting thing. It's telling me that uh, the host has disabled screen sharing. So I'm going to have to attend via um, my host role, which is oddly enough in, encapsulated in a smartphone application. So, so give me just a moment and we will be released from this bondage. Um, okay, so uh, I'm just gonna frob the settings here and uh, provide myself with the privileges of screen sharing. As odd as those utterances seem in this digital age. Okay, um, great. So I think I should be able to engage in screen sharing now. Okay, great. Um, are you folks able to see my screen here? Yeah. Okay, that's that's good. Um, my condolences, but I bet I, I guess it's better than seeing my uh, my torso and face. Um, so um, you know, perhaps it's uh, with some measure of relief um, um, that, that you could see my, uh, my slides. Uh, I do have to apologize that um, uh, previously I was quite happy that my computer fan was not acting up this morning. Um, uh, but as I feared, anticipated and feared, um, uh, once I started the screen recording in Zoom, uh, the CPU load on the uh, the motherboard is is higher, and it started up the fan. So if you hear a a, a low whir superimposed with kind of a, a biplane type uh, engine sound, um, you'll know where it's coming from. And um, th there's little little I can do about it, unfortunately, for the balance of the hour. I've positioned the mic closer to my voice, uh, so uh, hopefully it won't be. Um, it won't be too loud, the background noise. Okay, 
Okay, so let's dive into the subject, uh, if we may, of functors. Um, so, um, what is a functor? Well, um, you know, in a nutshell, or in a in a phrase, uh, in a slogan, uh, as is a term frequently used in applied math, um, uh, functors are structure-preserving mappings between categories that offer two types of maps. Um, one is is a function mapping objects to objects, uh, function for for small categories, and the other are are, are actually a set of functions, um, one for each pair of objects that maps morphisms to morphisms. Okay, um, uh, between those pairs of objects. Um, so, okay, that's a a lot to that's a long slogan. Um, they're basically structure preserving mappings between categories. Um, uh, but you know that in in so doing, uh, in they are mapping object to objects and in morphisms to morphisms. Okay. Um, now this point about being structure preserving is quite central, and and they preserve several aspects of structure. Um, at the most basic level, morphisms between um, uh, two. And I'm gonna uh, switch over to this. Uh, uh, to this uh, blackboard here for uh, a moment and uh, permit myself um, a uh, the opportunity of a um, display of that um, uh, that particular screen so here we go um, okay um, Okay, I'm just going to try to, okay, so there we go, okay. Um, I'm just trying to get the, ah, okay, cool. Okay, um, and I'm going to pin this, oh, okay, okay, uh, why isn't this? Um, let's, let's try, uh, okay, well, the, the best plan, best laid plans of mice and men are, offer a um, little advantage here. Um, okay, I'm trying to pin so I can see this screen as the point of focus. You folks can all uh, zoom in on this um, screen, but maybe I can't as I um, share my screen, so I'm gonna have to go back and forth. So if we have, and um, I'm just going to, because of my illness, I haven't been able to uh, get the colored chalk that was hoped. But if we have a, a category here, um, and we have two objects, uh, call them A and B, uh, and uh, between these two objects in this category C, we have a, a set of zero or more morphisms uh, between those objects. Um, when we apply a functor uh, to map this category from C over here to category D, um, we will map with this functor F, I'm gonna write it with functor F, going from C to, to, to D here. Um, we are going to map A to another object, FA. Um, F applied to object A. Remember the, the category maps objects to objects, so we can apply it to an object and get another object out. And similarly for B, right? Um, here we go, uh, F of B. Um, so not only does the category do that, um, but we might have you know other other, other objects over here. And uh, the, the, so this not only does the functor map objects to objects in this way, but it maps the morphisms to morphisms, but not just to any old morphisms. So a morphism from A to B here within C uh, is mapped to a morphism, some morphism between FA and FB. And, and that much structure has been preserved. The relationship between these morphisms on the one hand and the, uh, the pair of uh, objects that they linked up are reflected in this target category, the target for the functor. So this morphism from over here in C uh, might get mapped to this morphism here. Uh, but 
you know, we have some latitude as to, to how those uh, morphisms are, are mapped. So, for example, these ones might, might one of them might be mapped uh, onto that same morphism, and another one might be mapped onto a different morphism between FA and FB here. So we preserve some measure of structure just in terms of defining that mapping of morphisms to occur between the corresponding mapped objects. But there's a lot more to this preservation of structure than in simply that, that level of, of, of preservation. We're going to additionally have a preservation of two other things. Number one, composition. And number two, identity. So if we have uh, an identity morphism here over on A, normally we don't write that. So I'll, I'll write it with sort of a dashed line here. That's going to map to an identity morphism on FA. So from identity on A, the, the functor maps it to identity on FA. Yeah, I'll write A in lowercase. Okay, um, so we have a identity morphism here from that same object. But what's really mo most interesting here is its action on, um, in terms of comp preserving composition. So uh, here, if we have um, uh, A and B, and they are linked by morphisms, and then maybe we have a B and a C um, that has a set of morphisms associated with it. Maybe these are sets and these, are, these morphisms are functions, for example. Maybe the morphisms are instead indicating subclass relationships or instead indicating um, factor relationships that one thing evenly divides another thing, or perhaps they indicate linkages via uh, roads, as might, you might see in a, in a graph structure. Um, uh, we might have uh, some arrows going from A to B and then some other arrows from B to C. And the structure of a category ensures for us that um, if we, if we uh, have a morphism from A to B and a morphism from B to C, there needs to be a corresponding com composite morphism that goes from A to C. Okay. Um, and uh, that's the, the composite of those two. So if we call this F and we call, let's say, this one, um, well, this one here, G, uh, we're guaranteed to have within this category, by the rules of a category, the rules of engagement of, of, of building a category, F composed with G. Okay. Um, so, uh, excuse me, I should be careful here. Um, so this is G after F. Um, alternatively, we might, we might write it F fat semicolon G. Okay. Um, so this is uh, uh, G following F. Um, we'll write as G um, uh, composite with, with F. Okay. And in the context of functors, um, we know that that will be mapped to a composite of the corresponding uh, morphisms. So if F over here is mapped to onto this morphism through the action of this functor, it's mapped to this morphism, um, for example. And if here we have the mapping, for example, of C and, and this morphism here, G is mapped over to the functor applied to G. We know by the rules of, of this category that there has to be a morphism, typically not drawn, just like we don't draw implied identity arrows, we don't draw implied uh, composite uh, arrows, but um, there's guaranteed to be, by the rules of engagement of categories, um, a a morphism here uh, that's that's going to be FF uh, followed by uh, FG. So I'm going to write it here: FF followed by 
FG, okay? So G, uh, F, FG after FF, oh, or alternatively FF fat semicolon uh, FG. Um, that, that is guaranteed to exist. That's that one here, and again, I'll put it in dotted to indicate it's typically not drawn. Um, that's nothing new. That's nothing that special. That just means this is a, a legitimate category, and we have a legitimate mapping into that category. What's more interesting from the standpoint of functor, of being a functor preserving structure, is that it's the mapping of this G after F over here in category C that with the functor F has to map to this same morphism here. So F of G after F in C, this, this chalk is uh, not recommended by fine grainedness, um, needs to map to F F um, applied to G follow, uh, after uh, F applied to F. So let me let me write that larger because uh, the chalk leaves something to be um, desired. So F of G after F equals um, of G after uh, F of F. Okay. So we can either follow this com this composite uh, over here and then map, uh, or we map to, to F of C, for example, um, uh, we can follow the composite and, and map the composite over to here, for example, uh, and, and arrive at it that way, or we can go over to A, follow F of F uh, and F of G, and we'll be guaranteed to have the same composite, okay? So, so here the, the functor, preserves this structure of composition. It also, as we saw, preserved identity. So F of identity on A is always going to be identity of F of A. So the functor here preserves structure. It preserves the structure in forms of identities, structure in, in forms, more interestingly, of this composite. Um, so uh, first composing and then mapping is the same as mapping and then composing, okay? Um, and uh, finally, at a more trivial level, it uh, captures structure in the sense of mapping morphisms uh, between two objects in C um, into, when we map that morphism, we map it to a morphism between the mappings of those objects. Um, so those are three ways in which it captures structure, one of them more trivial than the other two, um, and the one involving the, the composite uh, being most interesting. Um, okay, so having having uh, glimpsed, oh, okay, so I see. I cut off my statement of, the, um, of those identities down there at the bottom, so let me adjust that. Um, that's probably better, okay? Um, Hopefully you, you captured that verbally. Um, now let's go back to the screen sharing and uh, allow the uh, horror of the slides to continue if I could. Um, okay, so uh, there we go. Um, whoa, we don't need to do that. Um, okay, so there's this interaction between these modes of Zoom, apparently. Okay, so um, uh, we noted that it preserved composition and preserves identity. Uh, it maps these objects and it maps the morphisms in a way compatible to that. Um, and it turns out that uh, by achieving this preservation of structure um, and mapping in this consistent way, all the laws uh, associated with our categories are preserved. Okay, they're automatically preserved. So associativity, for example, unitality, uh, these are preserved with this mapping by a functor, okay? Those, those extra axioms or laws we saw in our last lecture. Um, and um, as I noted in my opening remarks, um, it's the mapping really of, of the morphisms that is often the main point of interest. And, you know, 
uh, the fact that it does preserve structure um, that we're mapping, uh, you know, we're mapping the composite, the com composite of the mappings is of central interest here. Um, now, from a sort of higher level intuition standpoint, it's really important in category theory to develop um, kind of a feel for things. And, and one kind of slogan or, or, or intuition that I like to encourage is this notion of of like functors as as tools that embed one category in another, so they embed C and D in a certain way. Um, we didn't uh, talk about it before, but you know, if you um, uh, if you add these other objects um, that I sort of uh, wave, waved my hands at over here in D, that's fine. We're not necessarily we're not we're not claiming that this category C defines D. It's just that uh, it's it's mapped onto parts of, of, of D. And very commonly, and in those little exercises I gave you, we actually have a very, very small category C that is mapped into a subset, a small subset of of the uh, uh, of the, uh, the 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 objects in the morphisms in D. And that's fine. Um, there's, there's no problem with that. Um, it's not like it's defining that category D through the mapping, okay? Um, uh, and so we can view this as kind of embedding C and D. Um, it finds a C and a D if, uh, is one way to, to view it. Um, sometimes it's a matter of abstraction. Um, I didn't always say that for example, A, B, and C have to be mapped to different objects. They could be mapped um, to the same object. We just have to do it in a, a way that's consistent. Um, so you can't have collapsing of objects. And indeed, in mapping morphisms between any two pairs of objects, you could have collapsing there going on where two morphisms are in C are mapped to the same morphism in D. And I, I did use that in, in my little example. Um, and um, uh, we'll see that uh, this collapsing operation is um, an important one. Uh, often it represents a sort of abstraction of C in D uh, and a simplification of that. Um, and in the extreme case of a constant functor, we'll map all the objects in C into one object in, in, in D. And all the morphisms in C, between any two pairs of objects, into just the, the identity morphism in, in D. Okay? Okay, we'll come back, hopefully... Um, uh, late the session to this this notion that um, there's um, there are these categories that contain these constructs. There's a category where objects are categories and morphisms are functors. These mappings between categories. That's one interesting um, thing. There's there's another category where the objects are functors. And the mappings between objects are natural transformations. Um, uh, and we'll see those over the course of this discussion group. Okay, so some notes on this. Um, I noted the intuition there with abstraction or embedding. This is going to be quite useful when we discuss natural transformations next time, probably in the opening days of the new year. Um, uh, so... You know we're going to have a lot of our attention in the in the functional programming context, uh, lying on lifting of of morphisms of their functional programming, where we're dealing with categories of things like Hask. We're really dealing with categories of of, of types or sets of a given type, and the funct and the the uh, morphisms are are functions uh, morphisms between two types. Uh, including possibly a type to itself, are 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 functions uh, taking that type to this other, the first type to the other type. Um, 
but it's really uh, the action of functors in lifting these morphisms that are of greatest interest. That's true in functional programming, but it's true in general for categories. And, and you'll often, um, beginning students might get confused because they think the interesting thing about a functor is how it maps objects. That's, that, you know, that's a part of it, but really the most interesting thing is how it maps morphisms, okay? Um, now, uh, a mapping that preserves structure according to the rules of a, of a functor is, is termed functorial, okay? And, and if we have these properties of functoriality, we, we preserve composition, we respect identity, um, then uh, it opens up all sorts of opportunities for, for solid reasoning and for reasoning more abstractly with categories. Um, functors are readily composed and if any of you watch the next lecture by Bartosz Miliuski, you'll find him speaking about the composition of functors uh, and showing that, um, that given that there's a mapping of objects from objects to objects, set to set for small categories, we can compose that. If we have two functors, F and G, um, capital F, capital G, we can compose um, those two because it's just composition of functions as far as objects are mapped. Um, as far as mapping morphisms, well, we have many functions there. It's, it's, not, it's not just one function for the whole category that maps morphisms. It's, it's for each HOM set, each pair of objects, we have a, a function that maps the morphisms in that pair for each and every one of those morphisms. Uh, that function assigns a unique morphism in the corresponding home set between the uh, the mappings of the corresponding objects. So between FA and FB, um, we will be mapping the morphisms from A to B into the, the morphisms between FA and FB, um, and and so on for every pair of objects. Um, we're mapping those those home sets, and we can compose those when we compose functors. So composing functors um, produces something that um, has nice features. It's a functor itself. And that should get you thinking. Well, okay, if we could compose it, is there an identity? Yeah, there's an identity functor. Um, the identity functor is it's just a function that maps. Well, what do you think? What's the identity functor, folks? Anyone want to speak up? First of all, the identity functor maps what category to what other category. If I have a category C, the identity functor has to map that to category what? Yeah, to C. That's an endo functor. It maps into itself, okay? C to C. Um, in the States, they'll sometimes call it C to shining C, but um, <laughs> that's a joke. Uh, um, okay, so uh, uh, so uh, the, the identity functor will map um, from one category to itself, will map objects of that category on, so a given object of that category C, A, will be mapped to what? I haven't given you many choices. <laughs> I've only given you an A. What does it map to? It maps to A. B maps to B. C maps to C. Um, you could build a children's rhyme out of it. Um, fair enough. And each morphism between A and B, that func function that maps morphisms to morphisms um, between those pairs of objects, what, is, what does it map morphism F to? lowercase f. It maps it to, it's an identity functor, folks. It maps it to what? F. F. That's right. And it maps G to G and H to H and so on. That's the identity functor. And the identity functor can be defined. And by definition of identity, if you compose it with any, any other functor, G, 
we'll get what back. G. Yeah, we'll get back G. We'll get back that same other functor. So composing the identity with any other functor will give us that other functor back. Uh, back. So um, uh, the identity functor is an interesting functor. It's a very important functor, and it's a functor that plays um, a role in in um, certain constructions quite nicely. It certainly plays a big role in this idea that there's a category uh, in which um, uh, the objects are, are categories and the morphisms are functors because these are the identity morphisms in that category. Um, they map the category back to itself. Um, um, so this is an endo functor, the, uh, the identity functor. Um, now, we're going to be seeing in an important way in this class, in this group, um, uh, a two types of of functors. There's all sorts of functors we're going to be dealing with. Um, uh, Profunctors are another type. Bifunctors come up and are actually introduced by Bartosz Milewski in that next uh, lecture, um, where he explicates a little bit further on functors, but then goes into to bi categories and, and bifunctors. Um, uh, there's there's uh, these profunctors will play a, a very important role in modeling. Uh, they're beautiful objects, uh, and and some important roles in programming as well, particularly um, in the areas of optics, uh, where they see some some very beautiful applications. Uh, but there's another variant between functors that are, is a particular particularly basic uh, foundational character. And this is between what is commonly referred to as a functor, which is actually a covariant functor, and what are called contravariant functors, okay? Uh, and contravariant functors are going to be just like functors, except there's going to be a reversal um, in an arrow, okay? Okay. Um, and I think I'm going to have an exercise after the session where you'll you'll see contravariant functors. Okay, um, they come up quite a lot in programming, actually, um, and um, it's important to know about them because they're not new beasts; they're just a variant of functors. Uh, but they require you to have new new appreciation. And at first, it seems counterintuitive, like you're dealing with the inverses of functions, but that's just uh, appearances. It has to do more with what's being consumed or what's being produced. And it makes its way into programming in some notable ways. They also play a big role in the profunctor reasoning and in many others. Um, okay. Um, so, so let's talk about uh, some further notes on functors. This mapping C to D specifies uh, for every object of C, it's a, it's a function um, uh, between sets for, for small categories, sets of objects to sets of objects. So for each and every object of C, it has to specify as a function what single particular object in D it's mapped to, right? This is what a function does. We apply it to a set. And if we say we have a function from the set ABC to the, you know, to the set of natural numbers, it's going to need to to be a function, a total function. It needs to assign for A, what to what natural number does it map? For B, to what particular natural number, number does it map? And C, what particular natural number does it map? That's what it means to be a function. So it is here. For each and every object in C, we have to specify what particular object in D it gets mapped to. Okay. Um, now it turns out that later we'll see profunctors kind of relax that they they actually allow you to map to a couple things, but but there's a little bit of um, of um, um, it's it's actually not a, a big departure. It's actually unpacks to functors under the surface. It's just um, we sort of view it that way sometimes as mapping to multiple things. That's all. Um, okay, um, so. For every morphism between a pair of objects A and B, it asks, 
if we have a functor capital F that maps A and B, it asks to what particular morphism in D between FA and FB does that does that morphism map? In other words, it's a mapping of HOM sets, these sets of morphisms between these these categories. So again, if we have objects A and B here, um, and we have this HOM set going between them. Remember, it's a, a set for locally small categories. Um, this is a, a set here. The functor specifies for this set a function that maps it to the set over here between FA and FB. Mm -hmm. So it needs to specify as a function, it needs to specify for each and every one of these morphisms to what particular morphism over here does it map. Maybe it maps them all to one, the same morphism. Well, that's fine. But it can't destroy them. It cannot say, ah, I'm not going to bother with that one. No, it has to map all these over to that. Now, it doesn't have to be surjective. There may be many other morphisms over here that are not covered by this mapping. And, and if so, that's that's okay. It's just not called a full functor. Um, but it's okay. Um, uh, it just, you know, uh, uh, the mapping um, occupies a subset of, of what's over there. Okay? Um, I, have, I have a quick question. Yeah, please. What if, so you have these categories C and D. What if D, can D have more objects? Is that possible? Oh, yeah. Is yeah, great question. That, great question. Great so question. So yeah. that object in D, there is no mapping from C to D for that. That object, right? um, well, it's, okay, good, very good question, and I want to unpack this more. And actually, for this, my slides will be be uh, useful. Um, so um, here I'm I'm going back to um, uh, to these uh, slides. So remember that that we're providing here a function from C to D. Okay, so. Remember my earlier example when we were dealing with, just a few moments ago, when you we were dealing with a mapping from um, a set ABC into the natural numbers, right? Um, um, here, what we, by virtue of it being a function, we have to specify for every element of the source set C we have to specify what value that's going to take on in the natural numbers. It doesn't say we have to map to every natural number. Mm -hmm. um, it, maybe A maps to 3. Maybe B maps to 5. Maybe C maps to... Tell me what C has to map to. Come on. It's got to map to the next prime. 7. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um... Come on. Oh, well, or at least the next odd. I mean, they're the same in this case. So, so it's <laughs> okay. Um, so, so if those, if A, B, and C map to three, five, seven, over in in the natural numbers, that's fine. That's a function of C to to D here. It, it's um, it doesn't say that we have to map onto everything in the natural numbers. Uh, it's not surjective. Okay, so so if, if if the category C contained the first ten prime numbers and then D contained all the prime numbers, you can have a mapping of yeah. those ten from C to D. Yeah. But there will be more elements in D. Correct. Yeah. So D commonly has a lot more objects, uh, but we just don't map to them. But every single object in C has to be mapped by the functor. It has to because it's a function. So just as a function from ABC to the naturals has to specify for every value for A, for B, and for C. It can't leave one out. Um, um, so it is with the functor. It has to specify for every object in C uh, some particular object to which it's mapped. But there may be many other objects in D to which there's nothing mapped. Does that make sense? Yeah, and I suppose this in, in limited cases might work the other way if you had a larger set C mapping to D, a smaller set, maybe you're just mapping even and odd. Well, okay, so if, if you have a larger set D, it's a good question. If you have a much larger set D mapping, oh, sorry, C mapping to D, which is smaller, 
Um, it's going to need to, by the pigeonhole principle, it's going to need to to collapse objects. Like, because every single object of C has to be mapped to somewhere. And so it's going to have to map some onto the same object in D. Um, it, what I was, yeah. an example of that would be if you have the natural numbers in C, and yeah. you have yeah. two objects in D representing even and odd. Yeah, yeah, example. yeah. You got it exactly. That would, that would still work. The functor here yeah. would still be valid. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Fine. No problem. And we commonly do that. Um, and um, for example, we may have one representing objects modulo four, and another representing you know, C representing objects modulo four, zero, one, two. These equivalence costs are zero, one, two, three, um, and and the same thing for um, in, in D, it will be zero and one, um, mod two. And when we map from one to the other, we have to map in a consistent way. We can't map willy-nilly, but um, maybe we map, you know, uh, zero and two from the source category into zero in the target category and one and three onto um, to one in the target category. And that's quite nice because all the compositions will follow through. So we have to collapse, but we can't collapse willy-nilly. Um, generally, we, we, we have to collapse in a way that's consistent. Um, so we, we have to preserve this structure, and particularly we have to preserve composition. Yeah. The, the reason why I, yeah, the, the composition is the reason why I started with these questions because I wanted to understand would you be able to give an example of how composition is uh, like maintained when you compose? You have you have a set C and D, and then you have like F of A and then F of B and C, and mm -hmm. it will map to the same objects. Or, or the the, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the composition in, in C is mapped to the composition in D. I don't know if I understand that properly. I don't know if I understand the functors between the categories. Right. In that case, right. How, how composition is always maintained. Right. Um, so you, in the defining the functor, let, let's be clear. Um, it's not that um, that if you want to define a functor, composition automatically, preserving composition pop, pops out. It's that you have to design the functor to guarantee that composition is maintained. Okay, so, so you have to make sure you cleverly pick that functor so that um, it preserves this uh, composite property, that this property is maintained. Um, and so you might, you know, think you have a, a candidate functor, um, but you run afoul of this thing because you... Um, you, you, you haven't uh, chosen it carefully enough. It, it's got some weird um, weird ways, some weird special case ways in which it handles something, for example, and it ends up violating this feature. Um, uh, we could probably come up with an example of that, but did I hear someone else uh, starting to uh, speak up there? Yeah, that was... Uh, yeah. yeah. really simple like mapping from something to bools like the natural numbers you can easily show that on paper just like through algebraic reasoning so that might be useful to illustrate yeah uh i think i think i see what you're saying um so um so you're saying with with something like um uh with functions um as the morphisms and and again like um uh, maybe maybe you're dealing with uh, objects as just being the values for the bools or something like that. Okay, um, I think we could do that. Let me let me see if I can um, go forward a, a couple slides here to see if there's something that would help this discussion. And if not, I think we could dive into that. Okay, um, so uh, give me a second and um, here we go. Um, okay. 
Uh, do, 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 these, right. Um, I don't think these are going to be that helpful with that, right? Um, okay. Um, so, so let's um, maybe we'll we'll talk through um, an example of this. So, uh, I am going to stop this and let's go over to this uh, board. Okay, so suppose here we are dealing with a, um, a source category. Now, um, there. Uh, so is this board? Yeah, good. Uh, so if we're um, dealing with a source category here, where, for example, and I'm I'm, I'm tempted to have um, uh, two two possibilities um, for these, but I think I'll do this one with uh, with factorization. Um, mm, nah, probably. Uh, Okay, I could do a monoid. This this might be kind of interesting, but that's um, yeah. Okay, let, let's let's do the monoid as our first example. Um, so you'll recall uh, last time we we saw some of the structure of a of a monoid category. Does anyone remember how many objects the the monoid category had? One. A single object. Um, so you may ask, how did it encode its structure? Where was the structure of a monoid category captured? It was captured, if not in the objects, in the what? Uh, yeah, the, the, the morphisms and the, the rules for composition, okay? So uh, suppose we were to have this single object, which is commonly written star. I mean, it, it doesn't really mean any anything. Um, it's not a set, but... What really makes it interesting is we have these morphisms, okay? Um, we have this identity morphism, um, which, uh, as is the nature of identity, uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't change anything. And then we at, might have a morphism, for example, here that, uh, that represents, uh, uh, represents one in this in this context okay um uh and we have to define for this category um so this is going to be our category c um and we have to define for this category what the rules are what the what these morphisms mean when when we compose them okay um so uh here we're going to have uh, an identity morphism, which is going to represent uh, zero. So I'm going to represent the monoid associated with uh, naturals. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to actually do uh, z, uh, z mod two, um, z mod two z. Um, this is going to be mod two. Let me just write it because this is going to be less familiar to people, but I'm just going to say, you know, um, uh, mod 2 for, for, for people here. Um, and we're going to be representing it with plus, so we're going to be adding things, and our identity is going to be zero, okay? Um, uh, but I'll, I guess I'll just say, since we're dealing with equivalence classes, this is natural, it's fine. Okay, so um, here, if we have the naturals, um, we could consider identity as being the zero element. We could consider uh, a given a given uh, morphism as representing one, and we want to consider here the the composition of morphisms. Okay. Um, so if we compose two morphisms, what do we get out? Well, 
we saw it last time. Identity with one is going to, well, identity with identity is going to give us what? Composed with identity will give us what? I'll create a little table here. Um, so is this visible? No, that's, uh, so maybe over here. Um, okay, so I'm going to uh, characterize here the, the rule for our category here of composing morphism. So if we have morphism F and morphism G, then we're going to consider uh, G after F, okay? Um, so if we have identity, what's uh, an identity, what's the, uh, the composition of them gonna be? Identity. Sorry? Identity. identity, that's right. Identity and one is going to give us what? One. One, that's right, for dealing with naturals. Um, identity and one, the other way is going to give us what? One. one, that's right. Now, if we have one and one here, what are we going to get as their composite? I'm going to have a, a what? If we're dealing with naturals and plus, there's going to be another one, a morphism corresponding to what? Two. Two, that's right. Here we go. Right, um, and so so if we compose this with this, we're going to get out a morphism too. Okay, um, so the composition we're just defining it this way for our category. The composite of if we compose one with one, we get out two. Okay. And if we compose two with identity, we're gonna get out what? Two, right? Two. And identity with two, we're gonna get out two. And identity, and sorry, two with one, we're going to get out what? Three. Three, yeah, okay. This is just for the naturals here, okay? Um, uh, so, so this is an example of a category, right? Um, it's, it should be a failure, fairly familiar category, and we can go on. And some of these are constrained by the rules of category, and some of them are our choice. And we noted last time, for example, we had a certain choice that we imposed. What's the first one here in this list that we can choose? Mm hmm? Which one is it? We had some choice in the matter once it came down to this one here. Here, these three, by the definition of identity, to be a good citizen in category world, this has to be the case. That there's an identity morphism, um, and when you compose it with anything else, we get the same thing back. Um, but here we actually had some choice, okay? And we'll take advantage of this choice in our, in our functor. Okay, so I'm just gonna shift this slightly this way so we could see the target category. So this is our source category, this is C. And now we have a target category, D, right? Okay, um, and in D, we're going to have one object as well, okay? Maybe this will be a bit distracting, but I hope it'll communicate the, the essential features here. So here in D, we're gonna have a single object, and that single object uh, is gonna have multiple morphisms here. One of those morphisms of necessity has gotta be the what morphism. Yeah, there has to be an identity here. We're going to be considering a functor between these, and it's going to map the identity over here in C to what over here in D. It's going to map what? 
identity to identity to identity. identity. Yeah, identity and T. So F of yeah. Okay. So we still have some screen real estate. Okay, that's great. Um, so F of identity morphism from C is going to equal ID over here. So it's going to map ID up to ID, right? Um, but we could choose this functor now. Um, so so that, that much is given. Um, but we have a certain degree of latitude here, right? I mean, there's only one object, so it's it's not that interesting collapsing objects, this particular example. But we what we do have an example of is collapsing morphisms. And that's really what I wanted to, to bring out with this. Um, so uh, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to, with malice of forethought, I'm going to map one over here onto a one over here in D. Okay, this is a, this is a, a different D. And I'm going to map F, my functor is going to map, excuse me, one, one here, it's a fat one. Uh, so this is one in, in C, uh, onto one in D. Okay, um, so um, we're mapping, we're mapping this, uh, this morphism representing one in the category onto onto the same guy. That's that that's how I'm choosing to define my functor. But now I'm going to do something uh, a little bit interesting. So I haven't drawn three and four here, uh, but I will. Okay. Um, Question. Yeah. Yeah. Do we have to say? That ID belongs to C, and then the other ID on the right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you, Wade. Uh, I should have done that. Um, and uh, so, um, uh, yeah. I mean, um, we could have indicated it another way, which is is more traditional, because typically there's IDs for every object. So one way to write it would be there's an ID. Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, I call this star, and I'll, I'll call it, so I'll call this star sub C and star sub D, okay? So it's like identity and star sub C, uh, F of this has to be uh, identity on star sub D. It's, it's the only object there, but um, this is also the identity on F applied to star sub C, um, uh, which was something we, we noted before. Um, but uh, because remember, if we have, uh, and I don't know, you can't see anything above about here, um, but you may recall that in general for a category, if you have identity and some an identity morphism it maps to identity on f f a that that has to be the case um sorry there um okay so so we may choose to have this the, define that in our functor um and then we might choose for example to to define here f I'm going to do something kind of that you might not be expecting, but it's to, to show a point. Uh, I'm going to define f of 2 over here in C. Okay, so maybe I'll, I'll write it 2 in C. And I'm going to define it to be, well, what choice do I have, folks? What choice do I have? What could I define it to be? Give me some choices. One thing I could define it to be is a 2 and D, right? Some new morphism, right? That's over here. I could do that. What's another choice I have, though? ID, for example? Yeah, I could, 
I can do it to be ID in D. Now, what's that going to represent? Well, gosh, at the at the expense of 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 disturbing this. Um, uh, well, I think I'll 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 actually animate this out. Jeff McDonald loves it when I animate out, uh, you know, the computational operations with my body. But uh, I think in this case I can't resist that. But what I what I'll say is that remember what two represents. Two represents the composition of one and one, right? It implies it involves performing one two times, as it were, um, sort of uh, composing those, those morphisms represents, as it were, undergoing one and undergoing one again, right? Um, and so what this is saying would be that if we apply one, we, we, we're in a certain state, and then if we apply one again, we're now back to the original situation. So it's almost as if, and this is where I'll, I'll act it out to Jeff's delight, um, it's almost like one here in this target category in D represents a situation where one is turning around halfway. And then if I do it again, I come back the other way and I'm back to facing you, right? It's like, we apply it twice, we get back to the same starting point, okay? Um, so we have that option here. And let's, let's see if it's consistent. Um, we're we're going to see if that's consistent um, in terms of the rules of a functor, okay? Um, so suppose we said this. This is a bold, a bold idea, this one. Um, a, a, a bold pro, uh, proposition. Mm -hmm. um, let's see if it hangs together. What, well, what does it have to satisfy? Um, well, first of all, we have to make sure that this is a, a category, this, this D. I mean, does it, does it really make sense? So let's, uh, as, a, as, a, as a category, does this make sense? Yeah, uh, yeah, it makes sense. I mean, it's a it's it's a it's a category here in terms of um, uh, defining uh, you know we have objects we have these morphisms and uh, we could define things such that the rules uh, for the morphisms um, um, uh, hold uh, just like they do over here in this original category so we could be mapping here onto a larger category per Alex's earlier questions, Alex Dumay's earlier questions, we could be, you know, mapping onto a larger category with lots of morphisms. There's no problem with that. And that will have the same basic table here will apply over here. Um, there's, there's no problem with that. But the functor is doing something quite interesting here. It's not taking advantage of all of this category D flexibility. What is, it, what is the functor doing? Well, it's mapping objects from over here in C um, to objects here, and there's only one, but it's mapping morphisms in a way that collapses morphisms, right? Um, it's collapsing two to be uh, ID. Now, what is, that, what is that going to yield? Um, in terms of consistency with functoriality, with the rules of functors. So let's, let's go through those, those criteria, okay? So first of all, do we have a legitimate function from the objects in C to the objects in D? For every object, every single object in C, do we have, a, uh, do we have uh, one single designated object in D? Yes or no? Yeah, yeah, no problems there. No problems there. Um, uh, okay, now, for each morphism in C, do we have 
Uh, so each morphism over here, uh, do we have a morphism assigned? Well, I, I haven't told you fully what that is, um, but I would argue that just by extension, you could help me fill, fill this out. And maybe I will do it as a table. So this will be our, our table, okay? So this is going to tell us um, morphism or arrow or function, well, morphism in C. And, and then we will ask, gosh, you know, I think I'll, I'll just write it as lowercase f indicating it's in C here verbally. And what is f of f? Okay. Um, and you don't have to deal with this horrible chart. Um, okay. So uh, we said uh, ID must map over to ID. Uh, one in C maps to one in D, right? Um, okay. Um, and then, so that looks like almost Paleolithic in its, uh, in its designation. Okay. Uh, and I said two maps onto ID in, in D, okay? So I'll write it like that. Um, what does three need to map onto? Anyone? To be consistent, what is it going to need to map onto? I'm thinking ahead. To one. To one. Four is going to map onto what? ID. ID. Yeah. And so on. So, do we have a a mapping of morphisms. For each and every one of these, do we have exactly one that we've specified? Yeah, if I, if I specified that out. Okay, but that doesn't mean it's a valid functor yet, right? A functor, to be functorial, to, to preserve structure, to honor structure, it has to do something more. It has to map ID onto ID, does it map ID onto ID? Yeah, it does. Great. ID morphisms map to ID morphisms. There was only one to check, right? But it needs to do more than that. It needs to guarantee composition, right? It needs to guarantee composition. The composition is honored. And we wrote the, the essential rule for that before, but erased it. It was right down here. But I'll write it again, right? Um, if we have... If we have G after F, in C, that's what this is. Oh, can you, can you see that? Um, yeah. This has to be equal to, by the rules of functoriality, to be a legitimate functor, not merely a pretender to the throne. This must equal to what? This must equal, yeah, exactly, exactly, f of g after f of f, okay? Um, so let's see if our functor qualifies, right? Um, so here we have our table of g after f, and we have to make sure that that as we've defined it, this actually holds, right? Um, so, so let's consider this, right? Does does this hold? Well, look. Um, uh, so if we have uh, ID and ID, we compose them, we get out ID, and we compose and we can compare that. So it's it's f of id here on the left, which is id in, in d, uh, and does that equal to, you know, f of id composed with f of id? Yeah, it does. It, 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 it does equal to that composition-wise. Uh, so it is with uh, id and, and, and 1, right? We can, we can check. All that composition uh, carries through. It carries through uh, quite nicely because 
we are mapping things in a consistent way here. Um, what, uh, so if, if we were to double check this for all the different values of, of composition over here, it's, in fact, it's this, uh, it's this same table. So what we're really doing here with F is we are, um, we are essentially mapping um, over to F. We are mapping things like that would be here back to this first uh, this first row, and uh, and that's uh, that's essentially going to keep the compositional structure uh, uh, consistent. Let me ask this: I defined how the functor acts on, on, func on these uh, morphisms within this table. So f of id is id, f of 1 is 1, f of 2, I said, is id, f of 3 is 1, f of 4 is id, and so on. Can anyone tell me, um, I would argue that this does capture the compositional structure perfectly fine. And it's because, amongst other things, this f of 3 is 1, f of 4 is id, f of 5 has got to be 1, f of 6 has got to be id, and so on. Can anyone tell me, if I wanted to create a pseudo-functor, a functor that's merely a pretender to the throne, and in fact does not obey functoriality, it does not preserve composition. What thing, if I changed it within this table right here, would um, would throw it off? What thing, if I if I altered one of these entries, can you give me an entry where if I altered it, it would no longer make sense? And we'll show that. There's some nice candidates right here. Anyone? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. Excellent. So, so this is going to be a pseudo functor or fake functor. How's that? Fake. You know, fake. Fake. Fake functor. Okay. Um. Um. And if we had mapped three instead of to one, I would argue it has to be one to preserve compositionality. If we had mapped three instead to two, right? Um, we said um, uh, three is being mapped to two. Then we're going to, uh, so if this were F, it's mapping three over here in C onto two uh, within, uh, within D, I would argue all hell will break loose. Why is that? Let's, let's construct a little example where we, we violate this. Anyone want to uh, suggest um, a little example that would violate this rule? Well, yeah, yeah, but that's violating. Uh, yeah, that then it's 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 not observing functoriality. It's true. It's violating functoriality. That is correct. Um, but it's violating it in such a flagrant, flagrant fashion. You know, it it's just so obviously off kilter, wacko that maybe that's to be given, but it's true. To, to be functorial, we have to map identity to identity. So, so let's assume that's given, but you're absolutely right. That would violate functoriality. But let's try to violate composition because I think that was, that was the question that was motivating this discourse. Um, 
Um, could anyone uh, come up with a little example that violates this rule, this compositionality rule of, of, of functoris, that it observes, that it respects, it preserves composition? If G were what and F were what? Hmm? Yeah, okay, so let's have F here be 2 and G be 1, right? Okay, so if F is 2 uh, and G is 1, we're going to look up what this is, G after F, right? F is 2 and G is 1 here we get out three, right? Great, great. So we, we get out three. So, so um, we know this thing is, for this little example, would be three. So, uh, so G after F here is gonna be three. And F of three here um, is, is going to be what? Well, we look it up in our table. For our fake functor, it's two. By by, I think uh, Jared's suggestion. So that's two here, right? So we're gonna get this whole thing for our fake functor is gonna be two. And now let's map each of these things uh, in their constituent parts. Okay, we're gonna map G over. So uh, G is one. So G maps over. When we get it, we get a one. Okay, so. So this is going to be a 1 and D. Okay, good. And, and then we're going to map over F, which is going to be, uh, which it, F is 2. When we map over 2 from C, we get out ID here. Right? So this is ID and D. If we compose one and ID with ID and D, uh, what do we get? One. We should get one. Is two equal to one? <laughs> not here. No, 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 no. It's not one. Um, uh, so, so that no, they're they're not equal. So that would violate this rule. That would violate the rule. The, the fake functor doesn't cut it for composition because there's an inconsistency here. It has to honor, has to preserve the structure. And the structure is captured, and one element of the structure is captured in composition. And we've got this wacko situation where if we compose over here and then map, we get something different than if we map and then compose. Now, it's a mapping, but it's not a functor. A functor preserves the structure, it preserves the essential structure um, of this original category in, preser in, in performing that, that mapping. And we are not preserving that structure as can be seen here. Um, we are losing that structure with this fake functor mapping. This fake functor is willy-nilly imposing two as a result of a mapping in a way that's blind to the logic of the situation, which says that three has to map to one to make everything consistent over here with what's going on over, over in C, okay? So D is not properly sort of um, preserving the structure of C in its mapping. It's not properly capturing that, um, that structure um, when uh, you know, copying it over into D, when embedding it in D. This is embedded in a bigger category D with, with, with these, these naturals, but it's not honoring that original um that original structure in that embedding okay um 
So this would be a fake functor. Uh, it's a it's a willy nilly mapping. It's not something which which preserves the logic of what's going on here. What does preserve the logic is something which captures this kind of modulo logic. Now, and I would argue that we could do the same thing. We did this modulo one, right? Um, uh, but I chose it that way. But we could have done it modulo three. We could have done it modulo four. We could have done it modulo 99, um, 60, 64, 256. We could have chosen any of those modulus uh, bases and we could still preserve structure. But we're collapsing. We're just not collapsing willy-nilly. This fake functor was seeking to collapse, but it did it in a most irresponsible, negligent, inconsistent um, fashion. Uh, it abstracted, but in a way that violated the, the structure of the problem. Um, here, we see an abstraction that captures the essentials of the compositional structure. It preserves composition, but it doesn't preserve all the details. It preserves the composition um, for, um, in a way that's interpreted in D. Um, it's interpreted in the context uh, of D in this simplified view of C. Um, but it's still true to the, to the features of the situation. And what we tried to do with our fake functor, with this functor that mapped, you know, three unsuccessfully to two there in the lower right, was kind of a ham-fisted, brutal, brutal force that, that failed because of its very crudeness. It didn't, it, it didn't map it in a way that was true to that original structure while collapsing. It violated the original structure, the compositional structure uh, in the process of collapsing. So functors are not, you know, just loose cannons that you can map anything. They have to preserve this structure. And they have to, by preserving the composition, um, they, they capture the essential, you know, a key aspect of the essential structure that we want to, to capture. And by capturing the composition and capturing the identity, we end up capturing, preserving associativity and unitality as well. Um, these additional laws associated with the categories. So this is kind of a faithful, um, um, I should be careful careful here. Um, that word is used differently. But this is a legitimate interpretation, simplified interpretation of C and D, what's proposed here. The fake functor is an illegitimate, sort of, you know, sloppy, negligent uh, attempt to interpret C and D in a way that just doesn't hang together. It doesn't add up. It doesn't, it's inconsistent. It's incoherent. Um, and it violates the, the structural invariance that we're seeking to capture. Um, so, so that example, I tried to be true to Alex's question by, by this idea of, can you give us an example that would collapse things and, uh, you know, show how Certain things, you know, doing it the right way could preserve certain things, uh, but doing the wrong way could violate these these rules of compositionality. You can come up with similar examples when it comes to mapping objects, whereby you collapse um, you collapse objects and in ways that might be uh, consistent or inconsistent. Um, with uh, the original um, the original sort of compositional structure, uh, but um, but I thought this this is a useful example to get that feel of you know how do we interpret C in a in a high fidelity way in D, um, but still abstract away from all its details. Is that helpful?
said it by capturing identity and the composition it preserves yep. unitality and I missed the other one. Associativity. So, um, so we preserve, um, so when we have a category, uh, we have um, objects and we have morphisms between pairs of objects. Um, and um, we have to show for it to be a legitimate category um, that, uh, that it maps some, some, that it matches some, um, some properties. So we have to define identity, and then we have to define identity morphisms. What do those mean? And then we have to define uh, composition, the rules for composition. We propose these rules for composition. Um, and, um, and it has to be the case that it's associative and, uh, and unital. So if, if, if you end up uh, uh, composing uh, a an identity with uh, another morphism, you should get that other morphism back. But it has to be associative in the sense that if we have, um, I have a little bit of space down there. So associativity would, would so composition deals with, with this sort of thing where we compose pairs. But uh, what, what unitality, or sorry, what associativity is saying is if you have an H, um, an H composed with G composed with F, um, uh, that it doesn't matter where you put the parentheses. So, um, so this thing, let's say I, I go like this, this thing is the same as H composed with G composed with F. Um, we can put the parentheses wherever. And, um, and we don't have to worry about, about the parenthesization. Uh, for example, this is true for plus. It's true for times. It's not true. Give me, give me an operator involving, say, integers for which um, this thing is, is not true. Okay, you can't. Sorry. Uh, you can't see. There's, a, there's an H. Okay, I'm gonna have to do something about this this chalk. This is an H and this is a G. Okay. Um, uh, so give me a give me an operator. Um, so we're dealing if we were dealing with monoids where composition is a operation on natural numbers like plus. Um, this is this true for plus? Is this is this feature? Yeah, it's true for plus. If if composition means plus, yeah, it's true. Would uh, exponents be? Something? Yeah, exponents are. Doesn't it doesn't work. It doesn't work. A to the b to the c is different from a to the b power to the c. Um, uh, what's another thing where it doesn't work? Minus. Minus. Yeah, doesn't work. How about another thing? Divided by. How about something where it does work? Times, right? It works nicely. Um, so um, there's there's a certain rule that we have to have here. These are morphisms. They have to be associative for it to be a legitimate category. And uh, that will fall out if you have the functor observing composition and observe uh, and mapping identity to identity in the target category you're preserving those laws as well it turns out you don't have to separately go and investigate them because the the structure of the function of the functor um together with the rules of the target category d guarantee those things okay anyway i hope hope this is helpful and i i i i thought this example, you know, by, by simplifying things to collapsing morphisms and by showing how we could embed, you know, C and D without using all the morphisms of D, right? Or, we're not using all the morphisms of D. D has all the morphisms of natural associated with natural numbers, but we're only using a subset, but it's a consistent subset. It's a coherent mapping associated with the functor that captures this modulo structure. 
but it's not any old structure that would be preserved that fake functor shows. We actually have to walk a pretty narrow line. We have to keep ourselves to the straight and narrow uh, with our functor to, to, to avoid being running afoul of the, uh, the compositional structure. It's very easy to be careless and to just say, oh, you know, uh, we violated, uh, it turns out we violated compositionality. And this example from Wade exactly uh, illustrates it. Okay, so so let's um, um, use what we can here um, to um, um, any any final questions about this before I go on to, to some other points. Just just trying to take advantage of the last fifteen minutes from the uh, uh, from those uh, slides. Okay. Any questions? Okay. So, hearing none, I'm, I'm just going to go on. Um, um, okay. Doo -doo -doo. Um, just, you know, essential, central points here. Um, doo -doo -doo. Um, right. Okay, so... Um, it's important to recognize mapping of objects is not guaranteed to be objective. We remember function to function as long as it's small categories. Um, it doesn't have to be an objective function. We can map multiple objects to one object. And the sort of prototypical example of this is this constant functor um, written at delta sub c here, uh, which maps all objects onto a single object. And all morphisms um, between objects onto the identity for that single object. And that's the only only morphism, self-morphism um, in the category. Um, uh, sorry, in the self-morphism that's mapped onto, um, to which mappings are made. Um, remember, there can be self-morphisms of an object to itself other than identity, uh, as we see in monoids, right? They're all self-morphisms. But only one of them is the identity. Yeah. Uh, so, um, so C C to D can create an abstraction of C and D, and we we saw that just now with modulo, right? Um, we can map multiple objects in C into a single object, um, and um, you know this might be something where we turn a graph, for example, as C. Um, into when we collapse certain vertices to be the same. So maybe we collapse all vertices outside of Saskatchewan within a graph representing travel distance to be a, or with representing, you know, minimum travel time or something to be a single node in that graph. Um, this mapping between objects is commonly not surjective. It doesn't map onto all the things, you know, not all objects in the target category D are reached. Um, it may be that it's just a subset of, of, of the uh, objects in the target category are reached. And it's very common in finding, finding um, um, these, uh, uh, these shapes within the target category. We're looking for a very simple shape, like an arrow between two uh, objects in the, the target category. Um, uh, and uh, this is actually pretty important um, for some students, they get confused here. Uh, a functor says for which object to which object it matches, okay? Which object in C goes to which object in D. It does not look inside that object. Like if you're mapping a set to a set, um, set in C to a set in D, it's not a function that says for each and every element of the set that's being mapped, what does it go to in the reverse set? Just saying this object goes onto that object. Um, and um, it's it's not specifying that, that level of detail. But of course, in a lot of carriers, there's no no set structure anyway. Um, it's just, it's it's a misunderstanding that can come times, sometimes come up. Um, so functors map these objects, but they also map morphisms. Uh, and, you know, you're mapping objects, you're mapping morphisms 
from A to B to a morphism between the mapping of A and the mapping of B. Um, and uh, it's a total function from the hum set of A and B to the hum set between F of A and F of B. Um, all elements, as a, as a total mapping, as a total function, all elements of that hum set between A and B have to be mapped, have to be mapped, each and every one of them. Um, and the special terminology that's used for hum sets, for mapping of hum sets, if it's always injective across the entire, um, entire uh, category, across how the functor is applied, it's turned a faithful functor. It doesn't collapse multiple morphisms into one morphism. There's nothing to do with objects. It's morphism. It may collapse objects, fine, the, the functor, but does it collapse morphisms? Um, if not, if every morphism in C is given a unique morphism in D, then it's termed a faithful functor. Um, uh, it does not collapse multiple arrows in C into the same arrow in D. Um, if the mapping is surjective, it's always surjective, at least one arrow maps to every single in C, maps to every single arrow in D, um, I think within the hum sets to which it matches, this is termed a full functor. And we talk about it being fully faithful if it matches both those uh, criteria. Um, this is not too much to worry about, but you'll sometimes hear the term um, in some contexts. Um, and if the mapping is fully faithful, there's an isomorphism between hum sets. And it's gorgeous. And this comes out in adjunctions. And it's great um, uh, that there's basically one category is like a reinterpretation of the other category. The morphisms are basically the same as the morphisms. For the functor we defined, if I could put it up there on the screen again, for this functor that we defined, is this a, is this functor faithful? Is this mapping between hum sets injective? Or does it Contrapos does it uh, uh, contraposed with that? Does it collapse morphisms? Is this fully faithful? Or sorry, is it faithful? Okay, I can only give you the hairy eyebrow for so long. The answer is. No, it collapse. It it does collapse certain morphisms onto the same morphism. So, a morphism, different morphisms from from this hom set over here on C, get mapped onto the same morphism in D. In particular, two gets mapped onto ID uh, here because of the action of the of the functor. It's still a perfectly good functor. In fact, I like this functor a great deal. It lives and has a special place in my heart associated with this functor um, and its ilk. But it's not faithful. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just it doesn't preserve all of the morphisms from C independently in D. Is it full? Is this a full functor? Is it surjective, this mapping from morphisms in C to morphisms in D? Is it surjective? No, no. We don't map on to three. We don't map on to four here. We don't map on to five. We don't, and so on. So it's, it's neither full nor faithful. But it's a good functor, and I like it very much. Okay. Um, 
ladies and gentlemen, I don't ask you that this functor be your friend like it is mine, but I would ask that you consider to not let it be your, your enemy at least, okay? Uh, okay. Um, if you don't like it, at least don't be mad at it, okay? Um, uh, so you can be mad at me. Don't be mad at it. Um, uh, okay, so there's no isomorphism here between Hom sets. It, 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 you know, compresses this. It, it collapses things. But there are times where you'll see these isomorphisms between the Hom sets, and that's gorgeous. And we'll see these with adjunctions where you have this kind of almost inverse mapping of these two functors um, and one category is like uh, interpretation of the other category. Um, you may see um, isomorphisms there, and a natural isomorphism um, to boot. Okay, um, so it's the constant functor. I've mentioned that in the identity functor. Both of those are famous citizens of the functor world, and they assume their rightful place in many constructions. Okay, um, so so getting comfortable is helpful. So, you know, within the Haskell context, I'd hope to spend more time on this, um, but uh, I have an a important meeting in, in five minutes and then a presentation, um, but um, not regrettably on category theory. Um, but, um, uh, but we saw um, in the video, uh, hopefully you did as well, uh, that uh, in Haskell, um, the functors can be captured as these type constructors or generics or templates, depending on, on the, the language you want to use. Um, and um, uh, there's some subtleties uh, associated with this, um, amongst other things, whether Hask is really a category that we'll come back to, particularly because of non-termination. Um, but, um, you know, here, the functor might be something like list. And so we are mapping an object, which represents a, sets of a certain type, let's say int, um, into another object, which is another type, in this case, list event. And bool is mapped to, by the functor, to list of bool. And double is mapped to list of double. Or a functor might be maybe, and we have a maybe int map to maybe event, and int map and double map to maybe of double, and bool map to to maybe or bool, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so there's many common functors, and all monads will be functors, all applicatives will be functors. Functors are at the bedrock of sort of uh, category theory and programming, um, and uh, uh, it, it, it's worth bearing in mind that what distinguishes it as a functor is that it has, at, a, at an operation level, a, an FMAP rule, um, a rule for, for lifting functions uh, that go from A to B, say int to double, to be a function that goes from list of ints to list of doubles to the to the functor domain. So we're applying the functor to the function is, is, is bringing it over into the domain to which the functor maps. So if the functor maps ints to list of ints and doubles to list of doubles, um, if there's a function from int to double, we'll map it to a function from list of int to list of double. Okay, um, uh, so we lift that function. We do that with fmap. But to be a legitimate fmap, map, it has to, has to match some, some functor laws associated with it. It has to observe identity. It has to observe, uh, preserve composition. Um, and uh, the definition of fmap is going to be a little bit different for each of these. For a list, it's going to apply this function going from int to double, let's say, to each element of this list of ints in turn. For a maybe, it'll apply it only if it's there. If it's nothing, it doesn't need to do anything applying it. Um, if it's a tree, it'll do it in different ways. But 
but fundamentally it it can lift this function so instead of just mapping elements as it were it'll map the uh, the functors from one one to the other like list, list of ints to be a list of doubles okay and how that functor works in the f map is different um, for those less familiar with Haskell, I had some illustrations of how this worked. Um, and some, for some not familiar with this language, the pattern matching syntax may have thrown you off. But fundamentally, we're defining for a given function being lifted, how we are handling, essentially providing this mapping by specifying for different maybe A's What's the maybe B we get? And that's defining this mapping scene here, okay? Um, so this is the lifted function essentially being defined through this. And we're doing it by, by having these case, uh, these uh, patterns being matched against the possibilities for maybe A, okay? Um, and I give you these exercises which basically explored this notion of Finding index categories um, within targets. And you will have found, if you went through this, that these functors will sometimes find things in a collapsed fashion. These objects in the index category might exist only in the, the destination category in a collapsed way, for example. For example, if we have A and B here, and only one, um, only one object in the um, the target category, we might map A and B both onto C, etc. Um, but essentially, we're looking for these patterns within this um, within this other category. Um, unfortunately, our time is exhausted, but so are the slides. Uh, had I my druthers, I'd talk more about functors in the Haskell context and in the functional programming, and indeed more broadly in software engineering context, and and talk more about this finding of indices uh, of these index patterns uh, within categories and, and going through some of those little examples. Um, but I thought that. That I'm grateful to, to to the two Alexes for for their suggestion of doing a practical example on the board, and uh, hope you learned uh, something from that. I do have to go now. Um, I have a meeting with the uh, health authority and uh, on our modeling, and then I will be involved with a presentation that Jenna uh, will be delivering uh, for our health partners clients. But um, I'm grateful for your attention here. And uh, I was tempted to have this session next week, but I understand the university is closing early uh, this year to give students an early break and figured that um, I'd do well to likely do the same. So um, I want to learn more about that, that closure. Uh, people would really, really, really like to see this this uh, group next week, I'd be glad to put in the time to do that for you. We're going to be going on to a thorny, I, I, I said thorny, it's not really thorny, but it's textured topic that builds on this lecture. And it's about natural transformations, which are these mappings, these nice preserving mappings between functor mappings. Um, uh, kind of like going, um, having two maps um, or a map uh, where you project things from the world and um, another map and you're finding mappings between the map, those, those two maps um, uh, th in a way that's consistent. Um, we will see this next time and we're going to spend some, some time on natural transformations because they, they can be subtle for students to grasp at first. There's a very natural interpretation of them and intuition once you get your head around it. Okay, so uh, that's all for now. Let me know if if you want to uh, acclaim a session for next week. Uh, I'd be glad to consider it. Otherwise, I wish you the very best of holidays, um, um, rest. 
I will circulate videos for next time in any case, and I will look forward to meeting you probably in the opening uh, days of a new and hopefully more positive year. Thank you very much, folks. Take care there and uh, stay safe. Thank you for your attention. I'll, I'll be releasing the video here.